I just want to invite now Stuart Hazeldine to join me. Ah, oh, you, thank goodness. Uh, Stuart uh, flew back from Barcelona yesterday uh, for, this, for this event. And this is going to be a completely different uh, approach to um, changing the world. And uh, just to introduce um, Stuart, Stuart is a British screenwriter, film producer and director. He's best known for his 2009 thriller, Exam, which I have to confess to not having been able to watch because I... I'm a bit squeamish, um, and it was uh, for which he was a BAFTA nominee. And most recently, he directed 2017 adaptation of William P. Young's novel *The Shack*, which probably many of you have seen. So, Stuart, when I kind of think about you, I kind of think most of us, you know, may think, "Oh, yeah, I'd love to be a film director." You know, that would be amazing. But actually getting from the place of uh, thinking that would be a great dream to actually directing films, like what was the starting point for you? What, what was the kind of bit that made you think, yes, films? Uh, well, I think it's obviously something that begins with uh, just falling in love with the medium of, of movies and for, for every person it will be a different film, which is the first thing that sort of blows their mind, I guess. I was uh, six years old when I saw uh, Star Wars and it's that was the up. thing that... Yeah, I, I, I know that someone's got some slides <laughs> listed. Um, Star Wars was definitely the... I was the perfect age for that. I was sort of... It was like crack for little boys, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, suddenly rocket launches and shuttle, space shuttles became rather boring compared to that. I think when you're a kid, uh, you just especially a little boy, flashing lights is kind of what attracts you. So um, I was interested in New York. I wanted to go to New York because of look at all those buildings and the lights. And I think movies like Star Wars were, it was, the film was a, a fantastical world that you wanted to escape into. So Star Wars was, was the first thing for me. And then I got a little older and Blade Runner and Alien came along and they both seemed like very authentic realized futures and I just they were worlds that I was just felt utterly real to me and I kind of wanted to get lost in them uh, that's what happens to you before your 12 or 13 uh, and then I think you know as you go through puberty it's not just that your uh, your interest in the opposite sex wakes up everything wakes up your emotions wake up I felt my spirituality woke up I felt like I suddenly all my emotions appeared and I, I found that it, I was also starting to have emotional responses to movies as well and some of the films that you watch you've actually said films had a huge impact on you personally on the decisions that you've yeah. made and actually on your own your own journey Can can you, can you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I think th that, that was the thing is that, that probably those little boy movies were worlds that I wanted to jump into the screen. Whereas I think 14, 15 onwards, suddenly I started seeing films where I felt like the film was reaching out of the screen into my life and my world. And I was being influenced and inspired by some of the stories I was seeing and they were, they were affecting my life choices. Yeah. So the first movie I ever cried at, I was 15, I went to see Platoon. It wasn't Love Story. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was a war movie, but I came out of that in tears thinking, I'm never joining an army, I'm never going to kill another human being. Uh, a couple of years later after that, I was deciding about going to college and what I wanted to study, and I was thinking about a law degree, but I was always more humanities, and I saw Dead Poets Society at the exact right time. I actually saw it five times in about a month. I kept going back and back and back. And, uh, and, Carpe and that, diem. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that just encouraged me, A, to, to do it, but what, what are you going to do? Yeah. And so for me, it was following the passion and doing something that I wanted to study instead of something that would help me some way down the road to have better business options. I was, there was kind of a conflict going on in me between what I felt I should do for a nice house car job uh, and what was the thing that I was most passionate about because up until that point, film simply was a passion. I, I had no clue how you went from loving film to actually making film. Uh, no careers officer will ever explain how to be a film director or an actor or a football player. You kind of have to figure it out yourself. There's a bit of a natural selection thing there that if you can't be bothered to find out, then you probably won't survive getting yeah. into there. Uh, and at college, I, I picked up my first movie camera and that was where I suddenly realized that it could happen and that, that actually I could make a life out of that and I guess I also felt sort of a quickening spiritually that God wanted me to do that yeah. so it all kind of happened in the same moment and, the, and there were two films in particular that you actually felt you were 
supposed to make, aren't there? Um, probably exam and, and the shack? Yeah, I mean, I, I think not every job you do, not everything you, you do, do has to feel explicitly spiritually inspired or, or, an, or anything, but there are definitely moments in your life where you do feel that. And, and in those moments, you have to you have to do it. I, I'm very much one for not having regrets and not sort of letting fear dictate my choices. And I and there were certain moments. If I didn't write the script, if I didn't take this risk, I knew that on my deathbed I would look back and wonder what would have happened if I had done that. So I think overall, that in a general sense, the reason I've gotten as far as I've got is because I'm fairly logical, rational, strategic. I plan, and and, and I've gotten a lot of fruit and profit out of out of being a plan person. My father's a maths grad who was in computing, so I have a very strategic side. But actually, if, if life is a, a game of snakes and ladders and those strategic decisions are just moving one square forward on the board, the, the biggest moments, the sort of the ladders where you suddenly go up two rows at once, they have all been instinctive, non-rational yeah. moments where I felt a spiritual quickening of sort of uh, what I call a, a green flashing neon arrow over yeah. a project. And when that happens, I just do it. I don't question it, uh, whether it's whether I'm really hearing it, because what I realized is that it doesn't actually matter whether you're hearing God clearly. That will come. I mean, it, it does, but it doesn't matter as much as doing it, because God always looks at the heart. And so if you're doing the, the wrong thing or the half wrong thing, but you're doing it from the best intentions, I believe that God is big enough to take that and turn it, to move you forward in some way. So it, it does matter to me whether I'm hearing correctly, but not as much as doing something, because that's yeah. what having a relationship with God is about. So lots of people, you know, actually get hung up about whether they should be doing something or they shouldn't be doing something or exactly what they should yeah. be doing. Whereas you've never felt like that, have you? You've actually felt like like if you're existing within certain kind of parameters of kind of calling and inspiration, that's 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 kind of your territory. Is that is that right? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think we spend a lot of time waiting and worrying. Uh, waiting is something which can be a good thing to do. I think that's a case-by-case -case thing. Sometimes waiting is the right thing to do, and sometimes it's just a procrastinating, uh, which I do every morning before I start writing. Um, but worrying is never the right thing to do. It is never, ever, ever the right thing to do. You will never find God in worrying, because Jesus said, who of you will add five minutes to your life by worrying? So if you're, if you're sitting in worry, waiting for God to come meet you in that worry, it's not going to happen. I remember reading a quote from Bono where he said he spent a lot of time earlier in his his career wondering like what the right thing was to get involved with uh, and then he suddenly realized it was very obvious what God what were the areas that God was involved with and he had to go and commit to that and get involved with that and then he would meet God there so I, I think you know worrying that doesn't mean that you just do it I mean there's still testing there's still a set of criteria and questioning that you need to superimpose on your situation I'd spend a lot of time thinking about especially the big choices but I don't sit around worrying about whether I heard God correctly that's yeah. that's not the big thing and that becomes a great spiritual excuse for not moving forward yeah and um, if you look ahead now what what's coming next down down the track for you uh, well, I mean, the, the Shack was a, a great opportunity for, for me to do, uh, to make a movie that would inspire other people to make positive life choices in the way that those teenage movies did for me. Uh, so I knew when that movie came to me, it was an opportunity to put a film out there that if it had even a tenth of the impact that the book had, it would have a fruit of people being less judgmental, choosing to forgive, choosing to uh, maybe try and rebuild and reconnect with broken relationships, and that was a positive impact on the world, and I wanted to, to do that. Hopefully that will happen more, but there are some some projects I'm working on that are also sort of inspirational true life stories, so next year I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm gonna be making a film about a woman named Irina Sandler, who yeah. was a Polish social worker who saved two and a half thousand Jewish children from the Nazis yeah. in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I think both as a human story and especially right now as a female story about a woman who did something amazing. Mm -hmm. We're very much in this world of like Instagram and living my best life right now. And living my best life always seems to involve holding a cocktail by a pool and looking cute. Well, this is a woman who saved two and a half thousand human beings. And for me, that's living your best life. Yeah. So I think it's important to be 
getting examples out there, men and women, but I think right now there's, we're just in a moment where we're really focusing on great female stories, and this just kind of came to me, and I said, I looked around, are there any female directors putting their hand up? At the time, there were not. So I just said, all right, until someone else better comes along, I'm going to try and make this story. So hopefully next year we'll make that, and I think that's going to uh, be inspiring to hopefully a young generation of teenage girls who are looking for role models. Stuart Hazeldine, can we say just a huge thank you? Every time I speak to you, I get inspired to actually you can fulfill who you are in any sphere of life. And I absolutely love that about you. Thank you so much. Thank you.